Greetings, citizens of Nerdtropolis. Sean Todd here, the mayor of Nerdtropolis, and on this episode of Real Insights, my guest is voice actor Kat Cressida. Well, hello, Kat. It is great to see you, and I'm super excited that we're now officially connected. This is awesome. I know, I know. And we were supposed to have like that five minute let's prep for the call. And we went on for two hours because we <laughs> had so much cool stuff to talk about. So we'll see how this one goes. We'll try to cap it under three. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I love it. And I mentioned to you, I love talking to voice actors. And you're one of the most talented in the business. You have brought so many characters to life. Uh, you know, like Dee from Dexter's Laboratory, Tori Stories, Jesse, the iconic Constance Hatchaway from Haunted Mansion, Marvel's Electron, even the legendary Princess Leia. But you know, they're all my favorites. And the, I think it's awesome that you're part of the Prince of Persia video game franchise. <laughs> that does not get mentioned very often, but thank you. Well, oh, I'm Persian, so that's why I love it. <laughs> and you voice the character Zara, which is actually my mom's name. So that's like a cool connection that we have. That, that is you- a really cool connection. Yeah. And that was actually my first experience doing a video game title where myself and and it was the lead, the guy who was playing the prince. I was with him the entire time. Like there were no separate sessions. Literally, we were next to each other. And it was awesome because it made such a difference in our banter. It was really cool. First off, I have to ask, what type of animation did you grow up on? Disney. I mean, the classics. And by the classics, I mean, like, I'm pre-Renaissance. So I'm I'm the, uh, without going too deep into my age, definitely uh, was there for... All the re-releases that were happening during the 70s, back when there was only the theaters to see things in on, except for those um, Sunday night, Wonderful World of Disney, when sometimes they'd show, you know, a feature. But uh, yeah, Disney features were 100% my DNA. Yeah, I I love Disney. You know, my all-time favorite is probably Lion King. I love The Little Mermaid. Fantasia is awesome. And then if you go live action a little bit old school, I love Mary Poppins. And I actually love Herbie. Herbie is like one of my favorites. I think doesn't get much love anymore too. And and I absolutely love that. I like all the Herbie movies. Like they're all fun. So They're all great. But we're also here together. Thanks to our mutual friend, Jerry, uh, who runs Eastern Rim Funny Book and Vintage Comic Con, which will be held very soon, uh, August 24th and 25th. In Baytown, Texas, very close to Houston. It's our, you know, just just, just really close to Houston, Texas out here. And you'll be it's making the trip out way. here. And you're making a rare appearance, you know. Uh, have you been to Texas before? Yes, but mostly, almost exclusively in the San Antonio area and once in Dallas. So I'm excited because there's a lot of events going on that I'm, I know I'm going to be at next year, 2025. Uh, so yeah, but so far it's mostly just been in San Antonio and once in Dallas. So this, this will be cool. But it's great to have you here soon. The other day we got to, uh, I got to learn more about your personal journey, which was truly inspiring. Uh, you're a survivor of a rare form of cancer and this experience has motivated you to dedicate a significant part of your life, supporting families, mothers, children who are facing their own battle with cancer. And you really achieved this by making these appearances. Like we're talking about at these pop culture conventions, such as Eastern rim, uh, to raise funds for donations. When did you first decide to um, embark on this uh, convention journey with a mission? There's the pop culture answer, you know, the the nice fairy tale answer, and then there's the authentic one. And since you and I uh, have have hit it off so well on authenticity, and that's become our buzzword. Truthfully, um, when you go through something deeply traumatic. There's no other way to put it. What what I went through, and there's great articles on it, the Daily News. Uh, if you Google my name in Daily News, there's a great article on the crazy journey. It was far beyond anything you could imagine. And if you tried to put it into a novel, you probably wouldn't believe it. And when you emerge from something like that, if you're lucky to emerge at all, you're really everything is different. And it really is. And your priorities obviously shift. And I remember there was a moment where we knew that I was going to make it like we'd gotten through the worst of it. And we knew that I was going, I was on the upswing, but I was still in tremendous pain, wasn't sleeping. Um, And when you don't sleep a lot, life becomes very psychedelic and weird. It's almost like you're stoned because you're just so tired. And, and that was the state. And So on the one hand, grateful that I knew that I was going to make it. 
But on the other hand, you're so exhausted and you're in so much discomfort that part of you is like not grateful. You know, you're feeling that if you're being truthful. But then I'd be in a room it, when you when you're in radiation treatment or cancer treatment, oftentimes you're in these upscale lobby sort of situations waiting for your your turn, your session. Um, and you're with other people. It's not you're not all private, like in the movies. You're literally in this very upscale lobby situation waiting for your name to be called. And I would sit sometimes across from families with kids who are going through worse than I was. And you could just tell that there was probably no way they were going to make it. And it was a wake up call. I mean, it really pulled me out of me sort of being focused on my survival and just realizing as bad as this is, man, I am so fortunate. And oh my God, my heart was just crying for these families and the kids, you know, God bless them. They, they don't, they don't, they don't know as you know, thank God, they're not aware of how dire it is a lot of times if they're young enough, but the parents, you know, you could see it with them. And I kind of made one of those movie cinema, you know, if, if there was, you know, if ever there was a moment, there'd be a close up and the violin strings and all that. But there was a moment where I remember clearly thinking, if I pull through this and I manage somehow to recover any part of my career and you know, the awesomeness of life, I'm going to spend a lot of time just being grateful and figuring out how to repay the universe. I'm not, I'm not terribly religious per se, but I'm, I would say very spiritual in that way. And it felt really important to have that conversation with myself. So that, that was sort of the beginning of it. And then slowly, uh, I didn't even know fan events were a thing because <laughs> when I went under the knife in 2013, they really hadn't become what they are now. And um, that was like 11 years ago. That was sort of the beginning of a lot of them. And I spent, it wasn't until 2017, as you and I discussed that I sort of got my voiceover career back, got life back, felt like I was part of the living again. And um, so Right around there was the time that I thought, okay, if I'm going to go do these fan events and and be a vain talent, no disrespect, but you know, if I'm going to go sign autographs and take pictures with people, I want it to be about them and not about me. And so um, so I, I basically tithe 60% of uh, what I make at these events towards um, a couple of pediatric cancer foundation. Am I going on too long with this answer? I no, we want to know this. Uh, Pediatric Cancer Foundation, No Kid Hungry, which I absolutely love. Jeff Bridges, of all people, the dude started this like 28 years ago. Um, every, sc every school child in America gets a hot lunch and a snack and a box of groceries once a week to take home to their family um, because food insecurity is such a big thing around the country still, and sadly. Um, and Give Kids the World, which is a Disney World uh, charity tied in with Make-A-Wish Foundation and uh saint jude's so those four you know i i uh, rotate what's going to what after which events so come on out and spend lots of money because it's going towards a really good cause yeah i love that great mission there and you listed a lot of great organizations i mean they do so much great work um uh, just like you're helping them out additional to the convention appearances how do you use your voice and your own platform to help others battling illness and trauma why, thank you for asking, Sean. <laughs> I'm very honored and very excited because I have my my new sizzle reel for it. That took only like three years. Um, I do keynote speaking and patient advocacy. So keynote speaking, of course, is when you're on stage talking to a big room of awesome human beings. Um, I, I have one coming up in November for the cytopathology organization, those are the amazing magicians and sorcerers who used their medical degrees to create all the tests that now save lives so that you can do early DNA testing to see if you are a likely candidate for a certain form of cancer. Thank God for them. So I actually am uh, doing a keynote talk for them in November. And um, yeah, all, all of all of that world of speaking. I'm at the beginning parts of that and very honored to be with All American Speakers Bureau, which is one of the biggest in the world. 
Um, and then the patient advocacy is sort of the complete opposite. I'm behind the scenes working closely with families. It's a volunteer position, but you train for it very hard as if it's a paid position. And you are kind of using your big mouth to step in the middle of helping out. So you're not an attorney or an arbitrator, but you're kind of serving in a sense that position um, when a family is having trouble getting the health benefits that they are owed. Um, you're fighting the healthcare company or you're working with the medical community that they're situated in to make sure they're getting the proper treatment and attention. And I love it. I get to be fierce and uh, speak up and, you know, really, really do some good with the voice as opposed, I mean, all of it's amazing. Everything's an honor, but that is very connected to real human beings. So. No, I love that. You're definitely using your voice. Uh, a big moment for you was your TED Talk, sharing your own story, which was amazing. Uh, probably got a link. We're gonna link. We're gonna link this so people can watch it because I think it's a must watch. Uh, how did it feel to see your story, your story's impact on the audience, and just being part of a a TED Talk? Well, it's a, this particular one was a huge honor. It was for Los Angeles and for a major platform at Rice Royce Hall at UCLA, which is one of the bigger. Uh, platforms in California. And um, it's it's one of the TED, TED, actual legitimate TED ones. Some of them are, I guess, franchises where people pay to do one and, and they're awesome. But then TED also keeps control over a certain number. And this one was controlled by the actual TED organization in New York and Canada. Um, the only way I know how to describe it, it's sort of up there with the Haunted Mansion in terms of like just life bucket list I never thought I would be invited to do one. It, you have to be invited. Um, it's not something you can even uh, you apply. You know, you really have to be invited. And then it's a boot camp, a very intense, scary, frightening. Oh my God, what did I sign up for? Boot camp where they're really teaching you tremendous skill sets. Um, thank God, because even though I had years of experience on the stage and camera and Shakespeare, it's so different you know, delivering a talk that's just telling a story and being authentic and real and connected to it. It cannot look like a performance. It has to be the complete opposite. Um, and I was terrified because I was a last minute addition. Some major celebrity, I don't know who had dropped out last minute, someone like an A-lister, I was told. And they were trying to find someone's story who kind of fit the theme for that year. And um right place, right time, someone at Disney connected me to someone at at the TED organization. And they said, well, normally people get six months to prep. We've got two weeks. <laughs> what do you think? And I was so cocky. I was like, I had no idea what I was in for. So I said, sure, I've been on the stage. I've memorized seven minutes, please. And it turned out to be the most nerve wracking two weeks. And um, literally the, the day of, I can say I was terrified. I had no idea if I was going to remember what I had memorized. Um, I'd never worked with a clicker for slot. You know, you have to slides. I'd never worked with that. They had those prompt windows. On, it was very upscale. Paramount, Paramount Studios was doing the filming. They literally had Paramount Studios doing all of the filming with with like drone cameras going across you like this and drop cameras on cranes coming down and you're just supposed to be ignoring them and talking to the audience. It was insane. Um, and I didn't have a sense to answer your question of whether or not I was connecting or how I was coming across because we we barely had a dress rehearsal and I'd missed it because we were dealing with other stuff with for my technical. And so um, I didn't know until I got off the stage and the stage hands were applauding me. Like the, the guys who had set me up on my mic who saw how terrified I was and knew they could probably see in my eyes that I would probably rather do anything than step on that stage. So they were applauding me. So I like, okay. And and then the organize one of the curators gave me the biggest hug. And this was not someone who was prone to emotion. And I was like, okay. And then I came off stage and the whole green room exploded. And those were all the speakers either who'd finished or were waiting to go on. 
So that's when I knew that it had gone off well, truthfully. <laughs> yeah, you tell me that you were nervous and stuff. I watched it. I'm like, I, I can't see that. All that stuff you just explained, I did not see that watching the video. What a touching video, very eye opening as well, and, and and great messaging as well. So I mean, you got you, obviously you found your way with it, and now you're doing more of those and using your voice, and it, it's fabulous. So uh, we're definitely gonna get people to watch watch it, and we'll get a link in this video. And so people can enjoy it and learn from it. I need to know, like, you know, what advice would you give to others facing similar battles? And looking back on your own journey, what are some of the most important lessons you've learned about resilience and the human spirit? Well, mine was a very extreme version. So so I wouldn't want to. There's all different levels, of course, and everybody's experience is very unique. But I think one of the biggest things that I try to put across when I'm honored to to be speaking to to regular human beings, to real human beings, not to doctors or nurses or um, scientists, is um, the baby steps. Because everything, first of all, when when I and again my journey is crazy and unusual, but I was misdiagnosed. I was told that it was fatal. And that there was literally no point in a surgery and to just settle my affairs. And I was young. I mean, I had just turned 40. And I mean, that's still, that's young in today's years in terms of like having to go. I, so I'm sorry, I just turned 39 and 40 was ahead. So that was like, I remember that thinking like, wow, I didn't even make it to 40. And I mean, what what is there to say? It was devastating. And so when you're hit with something like that, obviously you're blindsided. A wall of emotions hits you that you didn't even know existed. Like they make that joke when you work out for the first time with a good trainer, you, muscles are hurting that you didn't even know you had. Emotions were popping that I didn't even know existed inside of me. And you're, you are slammed so hard and, and so far down so quickly with with a diagnosis like that that you can't even see straight you can't you can't think straight on on a level that i never thought you could hit because i can't think straight when i'm exhausted right after a long day of t two flights and and layovers and all that you think you're you think you're out of it this was a whole level of out of it i couldn't even get to the next logical step for a while that's trauma. I mean, that's, that's the literal, you know, shock and trauma. That's the definition of it. So what I found was, and this was in hindsight, I did not have the luxury or the, the good luck or good fortune of anybody in my world who'd ever navigated anything anywhere close to that. They'd had breast cancer, um, other, you know, forms of cancer that thank God these days, you know, have caught early enough or survivable. Um, nobody had anything to offer me. And again, I was being told by the medical community, the guys with the, the, you know, the coats and the 20 degrees from Harvard behind them that I, that it was fatal. So which way do you go with that? And then to realize that you do have a choice, even though you don't feel like you do, you have these baby choices as small and incremental and microscopic as they are they were my lifesaver. They were literally my lifeline back to some sense of sanity and some sense of forward motion. Um, I, it's very human to want to curl up in a ball and just disappear. Why would you want to face all the scary? You, you wouldn't. I mean, it's terrifying. And yet that Buddhist saying, there's, an, a, there's a really cool Buddhist saying, I don't know where I first picked it up because I'm not Buddhist, but I read it somewhere probably, that True Buddhists believe or the Buddha believe that in every second, you have a thousand choices. And we can't usually even conceive of two choices within a, a heartbeat. But you start to realize if you really work at it and you really start to pick apart your moments in your life and look back and take those as lessons. Yeah, you had a lot of min minor choices that you could make and you make enough minor choices and you find your way forward if that makes any sense, baby steps. Um, some days for me, when I was at my lowest um, post-surgery and in so much pain and discomfort and uh, technically disfigured, there's there's no other way around it. I and mean, we were still waiting for some of the surgeries to put me back together. I was so low that all I could do was breathe. 
in and out. Those were choices to literally just take the breath and to let myself feel whatever I was feeling and give myself permission to be that low. We're kind of in this weird culture in America. I know other cultures aren't like this because I've been honored to speak to some people who have a different outlook on life. Thank God. Um, but in America, unfortunately, in a lot of a lot of cultures, mine included, there's a shame or a, a yeah, like a um, messaging of you shouldn't feel certain things or you shouldn't admit to certain things. And God, is that toxic? Because when you are experiencing this level of whatever, any level of grief or loss for anybody, you should be able to feel whatever you're feeling. And it should be, it, it is 100% okay. That's the other message that I try to put across. Because I was embarrassed to share what I was going through. I was scared to share what I was going through. It it should it, you should be okay to share all of those things. What is next for you? What do you have going on? Uh, maybe more projects in the works and more appearances apparently too. Yes. Okay. So by the way, shout out. I'm very honored to now be working with Prestigious Entertainment on my appearances. They have a lot of amazing celebrities, mostly on camera. They've got a handful of voiceover talent. So thank you to Patty in Chicago and, and her whole team. Um, and also with a new, uh, I, I now just signed with another horror um, strictly horror uh, management company for appearances it's called Slow Entertainment, which is actually just stands for the initials of the owners. I just found out. So I was like, why are you slow? Um, so very excited because I'll be doing more in 2025. But coming up, as you have mentioned a few times, Eastern Rim, which is in a few weeks. And then a um, couple of other things, which I think we're going to talk about in, in a minute. And then I've got Supercon, which is huge. That's in, in fact, their logo looks a lot like your logo. It's but super. First, yeah. It's super and comic booky. <laughs> Supercon, but Sioux Falls is where it comes from. Supercon. Um, and they've got Princess Jasmine and Jafar, you know, Linda Larkin and those awesome people, Jonathan, and some amazing Star Trek people. I think I saw Walter Koenig, I think is there which would be huge. Um, and myself and some other uh, amazing animation and video game talent. So that's supposed to be, I've heard nothing but amazing things about this. It's very high end in, in Sioux Falls. And that's a 501c. All of those proceeds, 100% of them, go to um, uh, suicide prevention for teenagers, making sure that people, mental wellness, making sure that young people these days feel like they have a lifeline if they need it. Great, great stuff. Um, which is, you know, at an all time high with social media and so, such high expectations from, from younger people these days. I don't think I would have survived it quite honestly. If there were cameras on me constantly growing up, I think I would have just disappeared. Um, so yeah. Um, and then a couple of other horror conventions, Tidewater Horror and Georgia Pop uh, Pop and Horror for this year, for this fall, which on my social media and my stories every day, every day, every day, I'm announcing those. So if if you're at all curious, you can check out my uh, my IG stories. And like I said, the keynote speaking and then I'm going to be in Florida January for a really cool uh, convention near Daytona, I think is where I saw it is. Not not Orlando, uh, Daytona. So yeah, that that cool stuff is going on. And apparently, something I recorded last year as the bride just finally dropped, which are those uh, keepsake ornaments, the very fancy, expensive ones where you plug them in and they all sync together. So Constance Hatchaway is a glow glow up uh, ornament, but it's it's. it's like the size of a Vente Starbucks cup. It it's is quite... massive. I was just at the store the other day and I saw it. It is the biggest box I've ever seen. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's but awesome. it's got all my lines from the attraction, which is really cool. Like it cycles through all of my lines and it and it glows and the heart beats and it's magical. And that just dropped, I think, like this month. So people have been tagging me on a bunch of that stuff. No, yeah. that is awesome. I love it. You know, speaking of conventions, you know, the pop culture stuff. Everyone comes out to nerd out about something. I must know what does cat 
nerd out on? I'm bad. The only thing I nerd out on are my my heroes from when I was a kid that were on my lunch boxes. So I got to meet Lindsay Wagner and Lee Majors at a convention. That was I acted around them the way sometimes people act around me where they can't put together sentences and they're just trying to tell me how much something meant to them. I was literally falling apart in front of Lindsay Wagner. Because back then, I mean, again, this is the 70s, which is ancient for some of you all watching, which makes me sound. But, you know, I was like four or five, six years old and they were on the lunch boxes. It was everybody's hero back then, the um, the bionic technology. And some some people are watching this going, what is she talking about? But, and, and Wonder Woman, you know, the Linda Carter Wonder Woman. And Lindsay Wagner was just an ordinary chick who lucked out and suddenly got superpowers and she was awesome and she was smart. So by the way, if you haven't, if you don't know who I'm talking about and you, she looks amazing. I mean, she looks, she has taken such good care of herself, her and Linda Carter, both, they both look amazing. Um, so I fanned out, but the real thing that I found out about, as you know, is Imagineering and deep Disney history, because my dad had worked with Imagineering when I was a kid. And I got to learn all of the secrets. Um, sadly, he did not he did not live to see me become the bride. And there was no connection there. I, I literally just auditioned for that, like, you know, a hundred other hopefuls um, doing their voiceover thing. But um, he would be very proud because the mansion was one of his favorites. It's everybody's favorite. It's an incredible attraction. Yeah, he'd be so proud. And it's a great attraction. So... I guess I want to know, other than the Haunted Mansion, when you go to Disneyland, what's like the first ride you run to? Well, so I'm not going to give the the right answer here because when I go now, I'm usually just going to help to help other people have a good time. I've been so often in my life, and I was a cast member, and I took full advantage of my silver pass back then. And I've been honored over the years because of the things I've been honored to do for the parks to get a lot of, you know, invitations there. It would not be an exaggeration because, again, my dad would take us there every weekend while he was doing reports and meetings back in the in the late 70s. Um, it would not be an exaggeration to say that I'd been there at least 2,000 times in my life. Not for a full day, but, you know, here and there. A lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. And my passion is the is the history and preserving the memory of the things, <clears throat> the ghosts of things that are no longer there, but you can still see remnants of. I love to point that stuff out. To me, that's so important. So when I go, usually I'm just there as a VIP tour guide. And so I will take the temperature of the group. But if you want to know the ideal way to navigate, we're talking about Disneyland, by the way, not Disney World, which is a whole other experience, obviously. Um, but Disneyland, the the way you want to navigate it, if you're not doing the whole paid genie thing, but you're just doing it old school, which is still the best way, I think, because you really get to absorb and enjoy the park, is uh, Space Mountain. You race to Space Mountain first. You get that adrenaline rush. You get there before it's the lines are super crowded. Um so we always race over there straight through without without stopping for anything, even a churro. Um, and then the next thing is Star Tours. So we kind of hit those two things first. And then I take everybody across the park. We race through everything. They're like, wait, can't we stop? I'm like, no. And we get over to New Orleans Square and we hit Pirates and Mansion. That's the things that I hit to make sure people get what I consider some of the best of the park um, early on. And then we can kind of relax and then figure out the rest of it. Those are my go-to important things, but it it varies for everybody, obviously. No, that's a, some good tips and tricks right there. I'm going to need you as my tour guide. Oh my God, I'm, I'm so excited about that. That is one of my favorite things is to watch people light up when they see and discover things there that that really you, you would not know about because sadly enough, as we've discussed, you know, the, the newer regime, um, God bless them, they're doing a lot of great things for for the Disney Corporation, but some of the beauty and the details of the park have been lost. And um, I don't want to waste too much of anybody's time unless they're a Disney geek on this, but there's literally entire scenes 
that are hidden in plain sight that you need somebody. It's almost like one of those paintings where, or, or photographs where until somebody tells you, look for the skull <laughs> that you don't see it. Um, amazing stuff. Um, there's the sample wall, the sample brick wall, where literally the Imagineers were testing out what they wanted the brick to look like for the rest of the park. And it's just on one wall and there's all different textures. And they just left it there because it was out of the way. And Disneyland, for anybody who, who doesn't know, when it first opened, uh, that was just a, a few weeks ago, was its anniversary, um, July 19th, 1955. When it first opened, it was a ish storm. They were so not ready. They were so uh, behind on finishing construction that so much kind of got left, um, including the attic in the mansion, which took 10 years to develop or 15 years to develop. And then they still were behind and opened it without finishing the attic. So um, just sort of that's I think one of the reasons that Waltz has that famous quote. Disneyland will never be completed. I think the reason that he said that was to sort of reassure people after all the marketing and hype for a year on the Disneyland TV show that it's going to keep getting better and we're going to finish the attractions that we started. <laughs> That's my theory anyway. No, I love that. Like you said, a lot of Easter eggs in the park. And so anyone that visits the parks, you know, look out for some of the micro details and some of the details that are right in front of your face uh, yeah. are right there. You just got to open your eyes and enjoy that. But uh, Kat, thank you so much for opening up and this, you know, delightful conversation with a lot of meaning and just um, authenticity and just being raw. I absolutely loved it. I'm looking forward to seeing you in person at Eastern Rim. So everyone tuning in, come out to Eastern Rim. It's going to be a great time. Funko Pop collectors come out. I'm going to have I'm going to have all my Funko Pops. I'm going to show these. They're so cute. Oh, look at that. A little bit of everything. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This person, look, Ooh, at, look that. at that. Oh, wow. And then this Didi has a has one oh, on. wow. I love those. <laughs> I know, right? I think they're called Remarques or Remarks or Funko Pop paintings. These are really popular, the glow in the dark. On a mansion bride. So, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah come out and see Kat. Right? Yeah, she has voiced every fandom pretty much out there. It is fantastic. And like I said, we'll see you at Eastern Rim. Once again, this is Sean Taj, the mayor of Nertropolis, and stay tuned for more movie news, reviews, interviews, and trailers.